Thanks. Massive apologies. We just had some slight technical difficulties at the beginning there. Um, but thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, welcome to all of you, wherever you're calling in from. Um, this webinar is part of a series that's being organized between the uh, SOAS Economics Department and the Open Economics Forum. So the Open Economics Forum at Room is a student society at SOAS. Uh, we're aiming to promote pluralism within economics, uh, and we're also part of the wider Rethinking Economics Network, uh, in case you've heard of that. Um, so firstly, I'd just like to say a big thanks to uh, everybody who's been involved with organising, both people within the OEF and within the Economics Department. Um, like I say, this is part of a wider series, so it's the third event. Um, so if you'd like to keep updated and keep following it, uh, please take a moment to follow our social medias. You can find us on Facebook at SOAS Open Economics Forum uh, or also on Twitter, that's at Open Econ Forum. Uh, you can also follow the SOAS Economics Department at SOAS Economics. Uh, if you'd like to join the conversation online, uh, please use the hashtag Economics of COVID uh, so we can continue having discussions um, as we go along. Uh, so, my name is Alice Malavoy. Uh, I'm a master's student within the Department of Economics. Uh, I'm also a member of the Open Economics Forum. Uh, today, we will be talking about COVID-19 and economic development in Latin America. So, it's really exciting. It's our first sort of regional look. Um, and today, we have Vias Franz, uh, who is a lecturer in economics at SOAS. Um, who has research interests within the region, particularly Colombia. Um, so today uh, he's going to give us a look at the context pre-crisis and some of the effects of COVID in this area and uh, how we can start looking to move forward. Um, if you've joined us before, you'll be familiar with the structure. Um, uh, Tobias will speak for 25, 30 minutes and then We'll, we will open it up to questions from all of you. So uh, I'll strong, strongly encourage all of you to start sending your questions in the chat box, which you can find to the right hand side. Um, and hopefully we can have a really great discussion afterwards. And just so you're aware, this session will be recorded. Um, and I think that is everything from me. So I'll hand over to, to Tobias. Hi, uh, thanks Alice for, for this and again also thank you to the Open Economics Forum and the Department of Economics for organizing this uh, series. As you said, I will first go over uh, a bit of the context of where Latin American con economies were before the start of the, this economic crisis that was triggered by the spread of COVID-19. Secondly, then I'll talk about, a little, um, about the economic impacts and market responses so far and thirdly, I'll point towards some policy conclusions and recommendations uh, for ways forwards, both from a perspective on multilateral responses as well as um, domestic policy implications. And then I'm very much looking forward uh, to your questions and comments uh, um, at the end of, of the session. So to start off uh, with a context, and even before uh, the outbreak of this current global economic crisis that is very much unprecedented, and probably the, the, the most severe economic crisis that we will we have ever experienced in our lifetimes at least. Um, Latin America already before that was the slowest growing region in the global south. Um, if um, I hope I'll be able to share um, some files with you now. Yes, so this is the first uh, file that you might be able to appreciate um, how between 2000 and 2015, compared to other regions in the Global South, Latin America has, had already been the uh, region with the slowest GDP uh, growth rate at 2.9%, obviously China being much higher than, than, than everybody else, but even compared to South, A South Asia, South Southern Africa, the MENA region, um, Latin America has um, a structural problem of achieving uh, economic growth. Um, and similar to the observation made by um, Gabriel Palma on Chile and others, 
I would argue that this largely due to the lack of productivity growth, so in output per hour worked. Um, and on this second graph, uh, we can observe that also uh, really well. I hope you, you, you're able to see that. Um, so most of the um, GDP um, has been generated also again between 2000 and 2015 by changes in labor input contributions. So uh, changes in the labor market, increase in, 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 in overall uh, population rather than in an increase of productivity. So, so there hasn't been really increases in output per hour worked, which is the productivity contribution. Rather, most of the GDP was generated by changes in population, which uh, shows us already um, that part of the productivity problem of Latin America is very closely linked to these employment elasticities of the labor markets in the region, but also much more widely uh, connected to the undiversified economies, uh, which has much to do with neoliberal reforms since the 1980s and onwards, and I get to that in a little bit. But crucially, and more structurally as well, Latin American economies uh, more generally have not been able to successfully transition from, able, uh, from, from early stages of light manufacturing industrialization to later more capital intensive industrial growth. And, and this is uh, sort of deepened, if you will, a dependency on extractive export oriented accumulation as well as on uh, service sector growth. Uh, and looking from a political economy perspective, this dependency can be explained by the dominance of an oligarchic elite that since colonial times have held interests in landed activities. So both in agro industries as well as in primary commodities such as coal, uh, coal oil, gold, uh, copper, zinc, nickel, lead, all of these primary materials that um, that this landed elite was very much focused on. And this historical domination of political and economic life by this elite prevented the establishment, if you will, of a power base that would facilitate industrial accumulation, both because on one hand, we had a very, um, very low com competition between a different elite faction and this very strong position of elites with this strong, uh, with this landed, um, the land owning classes, if you will, made it very difficult for emerging industrialists to compete over access to state resources that would help them uh, achieve the competition or competitive uh, frontier uh, with other industrial um, or industrializing nations at this time. Um, and this incapacity to develop a productive sector and the deepening dependence on primary commodity export and services has brought Latin American economies into a situation where they're very vulnerable to external changes. So any change in the global economy has very uh, severe ripple effects uh, on uh, Latin American markets. And this is what we can see with the COVID-19 crisis already, and I will get to this in a little bit. But what I mentioned earlier, uh, this structural reasons to this undiversified, to these undiversified economies in the region um, have, have been deepened by the region's neoliberal turn in the 1980s. So neoliberal policies did not only mean a weakening of the health sector, and we'll, we see that already in cities like Guayaquil, where, this, where the virus has spread and uh, the dead lying on the street without being able to access healthcare services but also other social services more generally that were being privatized, deregulated, um, et cetera. It also meant that there has been an increase in casualized labor uh, as well as in informal labor due to flexibilization uh, reforms, meaning it was, it was much more easier to hire and fire. There was no sur uh, surcharge as um, overtime, overtime charges, um, no sick, pay, uh, sick um, pay, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So this flex, this flexibilization of the labor market uh, also increased um, the uh, the amount of informal and, and casualized workers. But more crucially, uh, as well, these neoliberal reforms also weakened even further the state capacities uh, um, to achieve economic diversification because it was already weakened vis-a-vis -vis this, this powerful landed oligarchy and neoliberal reforms further sterilized or rolled back 
states, um, and that meaning that uh, this uh, had the effect that accumulation models post 1980s even shifted further towards the extraction of oil, uh, minerals, hydrocarbons, coal, zinc, nickel, uh, etc. Um, furthermore, the integration into transnationalized networks of capitalism, which were a very integral part of this uh, neoliberalization uh, in the region, worsened the situation. So rather than investing into the promotion of, um, uh, rather than investing into the development of domestic content creation, so to, in, to, to, to increase productivity growth of domestic economies, what the Latin American elite did with the integration into transnationalized networks of capitalism was uh, to promote an advance, uh, the advancement of global finance capitalism uh, through which they uh, get most of their resources from. And this also brings me to uh, my, another point which is important when we talk about the context um, of how we find Latin American economies in this current crisis, which is financialization. So in short, financialization describes the ever increasing significance of the financial sector relative to the real sector and the transfer of more and more incomes from the real sector into the financial se uh, sector. So with the integration into this transnational, into transnational finan uh, financialized capitalism since the early 2000s, Latin America's elite continue to um, accumulate large surpluses, mainly made through, uh, you know, through these financial, uh, ever increasing, increasingly sophisticated financial systems. And this is, on one hand, reinforced problems of underinvestment into the real economy, but also allowed um, uncompetitive, unprofitable firms to survive as uh, liquidity um, came into Latin American countries, asset prices inflated off these companies uh, despite flattening productivity levels. Um, furthermore, low interest rate policies and cheap credit made available through quantitative easing, which was mainly created to stimulate recovery of countries in the global south and to stabilize inter international financial market also resulted in an expansion of debt of balance sheets on the balance sheets of non-banking corporations in Latin America. So what speculative investors from the UK, the US, Europe, etc., did, they used this cheap credit made available from quantitative easing and sought refuge in profitable corporate bonds, equities, shares, stocks of mostly commodity, commodity producing companies in Latin America. So this inflated on one hand, asset prices, as I said, um, also lead, leading to a further leveraging of Latin American companies, but also crucially, it inflated commodity prices, which very much helped Latin American economies, particularly those uh, in the Andean region and the, and the Southern Cone, uh, to have relatively stable uh, recovery from the global financial crisis of 2007-8. So, what we are seeing now, and now talking a bit more about what is happening in this current COVID-19 crisis, is we see a massive reversal of this, uh, of, of this flood of money. So while pre-crisis um, or during the commodity price boom between 2000 and 2015, we saw a massive influx of, of, of liquidity into, into Latin American markets. What we see now with the, and since the beginning of March practically, since the outbreak of this global pandemic happened is a withdrawal of funds, uh, particularly from commodity producing economies. So what investors are doing now uh, in the global financial markets, rather than seeking refuge in uh, what, what was once meant to be a secure, um, a secure market in commodities, they now disinvest from these commodities and invest in mostly US dollars. So other currencies, but mostly the dollar. So they're seeking refuge now in, 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 in a dollar. Even gold uh, lost uh, value temporarily to the dollar, which is something specifically in crisis that doesn't really happen. And the withdrawal from companies whose asset prices had been inflated with the importing of liquidity during the commodity boom, as well as the withdrawal of finance more generally from emerging markets and specifically from Latin America, has several implications to which I now get to. So 
as I said, there's extreme vulnerability of Latin American economies to external shocks. These movements in capital and, and equity and the equity markets is hitting Latin American economies particularly hard. Uh, so asset values of American companies are falling together with commodity prices. Um, together with the falling global demand and the end of international travel, this means all Latin American countries will be severely affected by this. So both uh, commodity producing um, economies from the Andean region and the southern cone, but also the tourist and tourism dependent Caribbean economies, some of which uh, get 80% of their income from the tourist industries, up to 80%, but also Mexico and Central America that um, very much depend on exports to the United States to, of up to 70% um, of their exports that go to the neighbor in the north, um, to the United States. So particularly countries in South America and, 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 and in, in the Andean region are dependent on commodity exports. Just to give a, a quick overview in terms of the export shares, um, our, uh, Colombia, for example, exports around 50% of, or of all of exports of Colombia, around 50% are fossil fuels, 24% in oil and derivatives, 22% in coal and derivatives. Chile, as the world's biggest copper producer and exporter, 50% um, of all of its exports is copper. Peru, 30% copper, 6% of, of oil, lead and zinc. Brazil very much depends on, on soy, soy, soybeans and iron, but also crude oil. Um, so with the outbreak of commodity of, of COVID-19, um, um, we see this plummeting of, of, of commodity prices, what I said with the withdrawal from assets uh, from international investors, but also the OPEC Russia price war, but also more generally because of course, when there is no production happening globally, there's also no demand for these commodities. So that's also one of the reasons. And, and most crucially, what we saw, oil contracting now by over 100%, and for the first time ever, standing below 40%. Uh, one, some, of the, some of the varieties, I think the, the Texan variety dropped up to minus 40 US dollars at some point two days ago. So um, this means that a lot of the revenues from specifically um, commodity producing economies will fall and uh, will fall away. Similarly, coal has contracted by over 50%, copper has decreased by over 20%, zinc fell uh, by over 20%, lead, soybeans, all of these commodities have been plummeting since uh, the outbreak of crisis. And as I said, another problem is this, the, and, and, uh, beside the, and the, 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 the um, very small diversification of these economies is that we see a dependency on, demand, on global demand, specifically from China and the United States. Mexico exports around 73% of all of its export to the United States, Paraguay about 60, Honduras around 50, um, Belize 22% to the US, 19 to the UK, Chile, Peru, and, and Brazil all all depend on demand from China. So this is also another exacerbating factor when it comes to the effects of COVID-19 for these for, for the for the different for the different economies in the region. So yeah, this this weaker and and, and for some commodities non-existing external demand further threatens these export-oriented countries, not just extractive exporters, but also uh, countries that focus on other non-traditional exports such as bananas, coffee, sugar garment, while, while demand might not drop such significantly as for fossil fuels, it, it still has been dropping quite substantially for these products. Um, and as I said, this has left the, the, the region's economy in a very, very vulnerable position, including, of course, uh, and what I said earlier, uh, the countries dependent on income from tourism, particularly Caribbean islands. So. What does this mean for public finance and for, for the balance sheets of uh, the countries that we talked about? So the fall of revenues from commodity exports, from tourism, from external demand, this alone is putting immense pressure on public balance sheets um, as revenue streams are drying up. 
effectively. And all that in a situation where more public investment is needed, both to provide food and medicine, um, as supply bottlenecks will intensify over the next few weeks, uh, but also to support businesses and workers. So we have a more need for more public investment, yet a drying up of income um, due to the fact um, of commodity prices, tourism, external demand dropping. So, and in addition to that, countries and firms in Latin America have financed their economies and social system and, and corporations through external funding due to the financialization of global economy. This is, this is a very cheap way to finance um, um, operations, to debt finance operations, basically. And with the tightening of the global financial conditions that is happening as, um, as the outbreak of COVID-19 uh, intensifies, uh, this will put an additional pressure on balance sheets of corporations and governments. Because we also have the risk that, that there will be asset fire sales uh, that may follow as financial intermediaries on, also want to liquidate their holdings to meet funding withdrawal requests from their investors, which would exacerbate even further the market turmoil that we're currently seeing. Um, so countries that are aligned on external funding and external financing, which are mo which most Latin American countries are, will experience sudden stops to their external to 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 to, to access to external funding and further disorderly market conditions in the global economy. So this is an additional layer to obviously the direct economic fallout that I explained earlier, but also to the extra economic cost that this health crisis um, is, is having due to, the, um, due to the funding of food, medicine, etc. And if this all wasn't enough, um, and some of you might, might already think, well, this, there's, there's really no good news that I'm, I'm, I'm hearing right now, um, and there's more to come uh, because when we when we look at this flight of capital to safe havens and this withdrawal of asset uh, held in Latin America to the US dollar, to the yen, to the euros, also obviously affected um, exchange rates. So domestic currencies, while, um, while the dollar, the yen, the euro all appreciated, domestic the currencies and specifically those of commodity export or exporters with flexible exchange rate have depreciated sharply. So while before the crisis, this massive inflows led to an appreciation and overvaluation of the local currencies, which um, a lot of the countries allowed to happen because it, it, would, it would benefit them and their exports. Um, the withdrawal of funds um, and global disinvestment from commodity assets in this fallout has led to currency prices uh, dropping significantly more even, uh, even than after the financial crisis of 2007 and 8. So in the last 40 days, or beginning of March, if you will, uh, which is a bit longer, the Mexican peso has lost over 30% of its value. The Brazilian real has, and the Colombian peso have lost both around 25%. Chile and Argentinian peso contract by around 10%. Um, and given that most of the debt is held in US dollars, this means that an already um, problematic debt um, situation when it comes to public debt and private debt will seriously worsen with uh, the devaluation of the local currencies, particularly for, for countries like Argentina that, uh, Argentina that already are renegotiating currently a hundred billion US dollar debt from previous crises, this will uh, um, lead to additional pressure on, 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 on their balance sheets. For households and corporation, this means that besides from the fall in global demand and the fall of asset prices, uh, businesses will also face credit crunch um, as investors flee and financial institutions face liquidity crisis themselves. Um, so they don't really want to um, give uh, loans to, to corporation. And even in a case where, where that would be able uh, and where corporations would be able to uh, um, get credit, a lot of uh, companies don't want to use uh, or don't want to, um, let's say, risk even more and, 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 and take on loans in this very uncertain times. 
Um, so we see production is stopping, debt for the, the, the debt burden increases also due to the currency depreciation and the risk of defaults and bankruptcy increase. For households, obviously, I haven't really talked about the, the exploding household debt also to, as, a, as a result from financialization. Um, but besides this and besides the, the pressure that will, it will put on households in terms of debt, um, um, it will most, in the, in the more immediate um, future, it will particularly hit them when it comes to the unemployment um, and food shortages and shortages in medicine due to rising bottlenecks, but particularly due to the fact that a lot of them will go unemployed without uh, um, having access to any uh, sort of um, safety net that was completely eradicated um, in the uh, neoliberalization uh, since the 1980s. And most workers in Latin America's highly flexibilized employment markets live day to day or are in formal employment, so uh, many of them are not able to self-isolate because given that there's a lack of response from the government, from most governments to uh, to supply uh, food um, and and um, and other essential goods, uh, a lot of these informal and 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 flexibilized or casualized employees have to go out um, anyway, and they can't self self isolate, um, risking obviously to get sick and spread this disease further, particularly um, in um, uh, informal settlements where this risk, of course, of both of having to work because of the employment situation that, you've, that, that a lot of uh, the people find themselves in, but also um, due to the crowdedness um, of these places where risk of containment increases. Um, yeah, so this, this, this is a bit of an overview um, when it comes to households and corporations. Uh, in terms of the GDP outlook, the recent economic, uh, world economic outlook of, of the IMF, uh, also saw that the region's economy overall will shrink by around 5.2%, and this contraction would be much more severe than during the 1980 debt crisis uh, of Latin America and the, 19, the 2009 recession as a fallout of the global financial crisis. And, and we will most likely see the sharpest contraction uh, in the last 50 years. I uh, just had a small graph here from the IMF see uh, the way where you can appreciate um, that, uh, that this contraction uh, of 2020 will be much more severe than previous um, previous economic crisis that the region faced in the past. Um, and as economic and health crisis will deepen, uh, because we're still at, the, at the, the start of this, and global demand will, will fall further, particularly from China and the United States, these already very dire economic projections may need to very well to be revised downwards. Um, and Latin American economies have to seriously start preparing for a depression uh, as we see this unprecedented decline in trade and commerce, corporations defaulting or going bankrupt, bankrupt due to the exploding debt burdens and to the tightening credit crunch, uh, sovereign debt crises and further uh, currency devaluation, we will most likely see financial crisis uh, due to uh, households and corporations defaulting on their private debt, and uh, investors want to want to liquidate their their in investments, putting additional pressure on, inter uh, on on financial intermediaries, and we obviously will see a huge jump in unemployment, poverty, and inequality. And some of you who might be uh, familiar with Latin America. Uh, have or have read about the lost decade of the 80s that was caused by this 1980 debt crisis. Uh, what is likely to happen is uh, that we will see another of, of, of such a lost decade in the region, um, most likely lasting even longer than the one in the 80s. So, um, this is, as I said, a very negative, a very daunting outlook. Um, and some of you might ask, is there any silver lining at all or are there any positives at all in this and going forward? Um, and I would say, yes, there is definitely the chance to fundamentally restructure and rethink 
the way in which economies and societies are organized in the long run. So there's a chance to achieve a shift away from this dominant paradigm that was followed by so many Latin American countries in the past and also pushed by international financial institutions such as the IMF and World Bank in the past, which is this neoliberal financialized model of, of accumulation, very much focused on export oriented extractive um, strategies, right? So there is the chance because of the deep crisis that we face ourselves in, particularly when, if, if it is possible that oil contracts below zero, zero dollar a barrel, I think anything is possible. But first, I think we have to think about the immediate policies to mitigate the consequences. And here, given the urgency, we will have to make use of the tools that are available already. And despite their existing, that the flaws of these international institutions, such as the IMF, um, they, we must still, I think, um, use them or, or argue that they will have to be made fit for purpose to meet this crisis. So there, there are several, um, several measures that, that, that IMF, World Bank, and, finance, and international institutions can make. So from a multilateral perspective, at first, the IMF should be preparing for a massive um, issuance of new special drawing rights um, to, uh, for, you know, uh, to, 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 to help um, countries in Latin America um, to, for their balance sheets. So what we've already seen in, uh, from the IMF, that, that there has been a massive expansion of the Catastrophe Containment and Relief Trust to support balance of payment of poor countries and also of Latin American companies. But these special drawing rights and, and creation of new, of new ones and existing and, and transferring existing one that should be distributed without conditionality. So not like, like before where the IMF used a lot of their funds uh, to put um, conditionalities in place um, that basically introduced neoliberal reforms. This should be done without conditionality. And that would help embattle governments to free up fiscal resources and increase healthcare funding um, and spending uh, and finance key imports specifically to address crucial supply bottlenecks that will arise in the next few weeks. Secondly, the IMF and policymakers from the global north should be making plans for a significant debt, debt restructuring. So um, the high levels of public and private could easily render all of these efforts to mitigate the direct consequences of COVID-19 futile since additional loans from the SDR, from the special drawing rights, will be used to finance the exploding debt burden. And so I would argue that a moratorium, so it's, yeah, a freeze on debt is not enough. Um, but I would say that a crisis of this proportion uh, calls for a complete cancellation of all debt held by uh, Latin American um, countries. Um, so this is something that, that can be done from um, a multilateral perspective. And third, governments uh, should consider new and more tighter capital controls to prevent financial markets from exacerbating the COVID-19 fallouts in Latin America, meaning uh, that capital is not allowed to leave the countries um, so easily as before. So basically reversing some of the uh, um, financial liberalization policies as well. Including um, and looking at domestic policies, I would, I would argue that this looming economic crisis uh, can only be addressed if Latin American governments start to radically rethink economic policy making. So besides the creation of new fiscal resources where that is possible through monetized deficits um, and or monetary financing of government spending where, where it is possible and there's no inflationary risks um, in, in, in the countries, this needs to go hand in hand with a reversal of privatization reforms and particularly uh, um, the nationalization of both commodity extracting companies as well as banks. And this shift towards a more state-led developmental model, if you will, uh, could use nationalized extractive revenues and newly created resources and can also oblige nationalized banks to forward the credits made available to them in, uh, in the recovery packages and stimulus packages that have been rolled out. For example, in Colombia, we see that banks, private banks, 
that now have access to additional funds um, post-COVID or in the COVID-19 crisis are unwilling to give this to medium and small enterprises. So similarly to, to, to other monetary stimulus packages in, in, uh, before, um, and what I think would be a, a solution to this is to nationalize the bank system um, as well as the incomes from commodity, um, commodity producers. So this could help households to overcome liquidity solvency problems. Uh, it could uh, help governments to suspend, suspend mortgage and rent payment, uh, specifically for uh, the informal um, and casualized workers uh, that are without uh, any income. Uh, this additional fund could be used for, uh, for unconditional cash transfer programs for uh, households that are facing uh, the burden, the biggest burden in this crisis. Um, and investing in social services and, and obviously in, into the into the privatized and completely uh, dry uh, bled try uh, yeah and into the health systems that have been bled dry. Um, businesses could be supported by extending loan maturities, deferring taxes. This is something that has happened in some cases, um, providing credit through central bank financing, etc. So in the short to immediate uh, term. These monetary and fiscal stimuli, uh, monetary policies and fiscal stimuli would have to be accompanied by more longer term strategies to build up support for strategic manufacturing industries to get away from the dependency on fossil fuel and other extractive exports. Um, and particularly, I would, I would argue these strategic manufacturing industries that need to, need to be supported in the long run in the region will have to be linked to renewable energy as, as well as innovative technology to achieve a productivity growth in sectors that are not as harming for the environment as well as for the sustainability of the economy uh, to take it away from the dependency on export-oriented extractive accumulation model. So just uh, to sum it all up, uh, this economic, as the economic damage of COVID-19 is shaping up to be both immense and inevitable, the region is in desperate need of a progressive and radical reversal of the failed neoliberal export-oriented development model that has been based on extractive uh, um, and agro-industrial accumulation as well as tourism. And uh, yeah, I think this is this is uh, with what I would like to uh, close. And I'm very much looking forward to your questions and comments. Uh, thank you so much, Tavias. That was really interesting. Um, we've already got a few questions coming in, so but everybody, please continue to post questions. Um, a few of them, I think you've. We had quite a few questions about reactions to the crisis. Some of which I think you've already touched on. Um, but I guess somebody's quite clear question was: Do you think the Latin American economy can recover from the crisis? I know you've outlined some policies that they could be following in an ideal world, but I guess in reality, what are your hopes? Yes, a recovery. So yes, a recovery is definitely possible. Um, and even even a recovery could be possible um, if if nothing basically changes in the political economies, which which is likely to happen. So um, there, there won't be any any massive changes in the in the short run, run at least to the way in which these economies work. But I would think um, that definitely with the help of an, uh, international institutions and with uh, the access to to um, to newly created uh, special transfer rights, um, th this could mitigate in the in the in the in the immediate. In the, in the immediate future, but also in the long run, and I would I would definitely think yes, there there is there is of course possibilities to recover from this um, as the global economy will recover. However, um, what we saw with the recovery of the 2007 and 8 financial crisis and with the 2009 recession of Latin America, what helped them achieve recovery relatively quickly was uh, China's unprecedented growth and, and, and the demand for commodities, basically, that China did and pulling 
a lot of the global economy as a, as a whole, but specifically Latin American economies out of the slump. And this is not something that we can rely on to happen again. So China is not likely to yet again uh, uh, pull the global economy out of this as they face some, some serious problems in their economy themselves um, due to um, an increase in shadow banking and an increased financialized problems that, that they've gotten themselves into. So um, if we rely on what has, what has uh, worked in the past, it worked only to a certain extent, if you will, no. So this is why I say we need a radical reversal of what has been done and, and a really, um, yeah, um, nationalization of banks and, and commodity uh, exp um, or commodity companies to then use these funds for alternative sector of development and more productivity enhancing sectors. Yeah, great. Um, we also had, well, we had a few questions about sort of different vulnerabilities and resilience. Um, I've got three questions which are all sort of on the same theme. One person asked which countries have been more vulnerable to the shock and why? Uh, one person asked, are countries which ex have experienced a pink tide more resilient? I think they drew a comparison with Kerala. Um, and the third one, uh, was Venezuela more prepared uh, because they had also recently dealt with another crisis? So did that put their government in better stead to deal with it? Okay, thank you very much for these questions. Uh, very interesting. Um, so let me start with um, um, with which countries are more vulnerable. I think I think that's just a race to the bottom. I I don't I, all, all of those countries were, uh, were were extremely vulnerable given the composition of their exports as well as the dependency on on tourism as well as uh, commodities. So I think all of them uh, very differently. Uh, as I said, the Caribbean uh, economy is very much um, hit by the complete stop in international tourism, whereas most Indian, Indian regions and the Southern Cone, as well as Brazil, uh, are facing problems because of the falling commodity prices. And yeah, so I don't think there, I don't think that there, there's a, some particular countries that are more vulnerable than others and 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 similar to the pink tide uh i don't think they are more resilient to prices like this um in ways that i would argue and that might uh, be controversial with some of uh, our listeners that a lot of these countries while achieving different political um engagement um, and political organization in a lot of ways their economies did never really transition to a post neoliberal model of accumulation. Uh, and they were very much, when we look at Bolivia, when we look at Ecuador, when we look at Venezuela, um, Brazil, all still very much dependent on commodity exports, on oil um, and, and, and other uh, primary commodities. So, uh, and, and very much dominated by an economic and oligarchy that in its core did not change just because uh, there was a different political um, organization happening. Um, so on a macroeconomic scale, I don't think these countries are uh, better prepared than, than, than countries that didn't go through the pink tide movement. And Venezuela, uh, I think, no, they're, they're, they're even worse uh, prepared than any, any other country due to the fact that uh, that internationally, specifically, it, uh, I, I think it was at the beginning of this outbreak, they tried to access some credit from the uh, IMF and were denied this access. Furthermore, their high inflation risks will only exacerbate in this uh, in this crisis. So uh, Venezuela is set to have the, by far the biggest contraction as a result of the COVID-19 fallout because it already has this uh, this um, position internationally where it's quite isolated. So uh, I think Venezuela is the country that is probably, if you will, the worst off um, of, of, of all of the countries in the moment. In the moment. Thanks very much. Uh, we've also had a couple of questions about uh, the US and the role of US power in this situation. Um, 
so one person asks, can we be optimistic about the uh, IMF's uh, SDRs in, uh, they say, since the US can veto them if it's over $500 million? Um, and another asks, what about US sanctions on countries like Cuba and Venezuela? Uh, and with the decrease of tourism in Cuba, do you think it will go through another grey period, as in the 90s? Uh, and with the decrease in the value of oil, will Venezuela face even more poverty and problems? Um, obviously, you touched on oil a little already, but yeah. Thank you. Um, so, well, um, yeah, thanks for, for these questions. Um, in terms of the role of the US, um, yes, this is especially uh, with the current administration in, in the White House, very much, um, uh, yeah, a question that, that remains to be seen. Will he do the same that he did uh, with, the WTA, uh, with, the, with the World Health Organization um, to defund the IMF at some point or veto uh, special drawing rights? Um, I'm not sure if this if this will happen. It can very likely be happening, but I don't think we should get caught up with that in the moment rather than pushing the IMF itself to actually roll out these plans. Um, in terms of the overall role of the United States in the region, uh, I would I would think that a lot of this focus on commodities, but also a focus on on tourism, what it has done, it has sort of led some would argue to the new imperialism as most of the most of the companies both in the tourism industry as well as in the, the, the export the yeah, commodity uh, extracting companies in the region are uh, us capital or european capital um, and, and, and held by and held by them so uh, in the longer run this this dependency or this uh, new imperialism if 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 you want to follow uh, the words of of of, of some um, academics um, could only be reversed if this dependency on these sectors will uh, will diminish, um, let's say, and then that you actually have domestic uh, content creation and, uh, and a productive sector that can develop capacities for for high productivity and technology growth. Um, Cuba, I mean. Cuba, yes, it can very well lead again to another of, of this situation. Um, however, with the with uh, the more well, what we've seen already with Cuba's response on the health on the health uh, aspect, with sending doctors to to Italy for the first time ever to a, to a country in the global north, um, I think they have also shown international solidarity where, for example, the European Union was not able to do, um, in some cases, to its to its own members. Um, so there, there could be a silver lining in terms of, okay, they showed solidarity. Will we, will we see solidarity for Cuban economy that will substantially uh, suffer uh, from the fall in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in tourism? Oil in Venezuela, yeah, I touched upon that. That will be uh, for sure. The real revenue that they still had, um, it will completely fall out, fall away, and 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 yeah. Uh, what 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 I hear from from uh, uh, people in Venezuela is that the situation is looking very very. Everything is quiet right now. Everything is died down, um, and they're just waiting for the next revolts happening. Um, but let's see. Um. Great. And also, so we've got about eight minutes left. So we have a few questions which we're very much looking towards the future, which is probably nice to close on. Um, one person asked, they noted that the IMF usually asks for austerity measures to guarantee loan payments. Do you think that there's a chance that they'll change that approach? Uh, one person asked, could there be any implications in terms of the debt moratorium that could deepen? or worsen fin the financial crisis. Um, and then one person asked, do you think the epidemic could be considered beneficial to some of the Latin American economies? 
as country uh, companies are scrambling to move their supply chains out of China, Mexico being one of the destinations. Um, thank you very much. Very interesting question. Um, just to start, I'm not sure I understood the debt uh, moratorium question uh, very well. They well, they just mentioned. Uh, it was one from Rob, I think. He said, I like the radical proposition of a debt moratorium, but are there any implications of such policy that could deepen or lead to further financial crises? I guess, could there be um, any negative implications? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, due, to, due to not, you know, yeah, um, indebted countries not paying their loans back um, to then have, uh, you know, and basically defaulting on their loans, Okay, now yes, um, yeah. This is this is uh, uh, definitely um, definitely an, another problem that, that could happen, and 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 that's also why any of these policies that I, I pointed to at the end can't really be looked at in isolation. So while we need a cancellation, I would not just argue for a moratorium, but a complete cancellation uh, of of all debt. Um, we also need, of course, to make sure that fin the financial system has enough liquidity, um, uh, so it won't uh, we won't go into a next massive financial crisis. So this is, of course, something that has to happen. But this is why I not why I didn't press so much on this is that I think most most responses that we've seen so far has al had, have already favored um, banks and financial markets over over um, small and medium enterprises and workers. So I don't, I don't, really, I, I don't really think um, that this is a big concern to be had um, primarily, but um, it's an interesting, it's an, it has to come together, let's say. Um, in terms of Mexico and, and Mexico being benefic beneficial, uh, I, I, I don't think so, given that, uh, that in China we already see um, a fall in cases and 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 overall there there will be the quickest recovery to be happening in China um, and so uh, in terms of supply chains shifting from China to the to Mexico I I don't think so because we start we're just at the start of the outbreak in Latin America um, and most most likely this will um, worsen in the next few weeks and months and when it comes to the IMF yes. Um, I'm I'm the first to criticize and to be very um, very pessimistic about calling for the IMF uh, um, to to the rescue um, and and all of us I guess from a more progressive background would would find it a bit um, problematic to to now say we need the IMF but it is we, there's not a lot not a lot of time so we don't have time to now come up with a new financial system that. That, that, that can arise and meet this challenge, which is simply uh, not possible. So we have to make sure that what we have, what, what is in place is used and is used in a way that learns from the past. Now you can say they have never learned from the past, not quite true. So they've already started uh, the conversation a few years ago um, before it was even a mainstream, it became the mainstream uh, in, 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 in other countries that austerity didn't work. Um, so I think there has been a shift within the IMF, but we, of course, will need to pressure um, that this uh, will, will, will continue and that new funds, and as I said in, in, in my talk, this new, that, that um, special drawing rights will be given unconditionally. So there won't be any conditions on, on saying, all right, we give you that, but in return you have to implement austerity policies rather we give you that, and please reverse all of these policies that we where we said 30 years ago you should be doing. Um, if there is such a self-reflection in the IMF, uh, I, I don't know, but I, I do have hope that that there is, um, especially now with the outbreak of the crisis, a realization that austerity has completely failed. And I mean, we already see that when I talk to people that work in the government in the UK. Uh, even in, in the UK, you have a uh, questioning of these measures and everybody is becoming sort of half-baked Keynesianists all of a sudden, people who for years have been Austrian 
in Austrian, following the Austrian school, um, have, are now all of a sudden Keynesians and want public spending to rise and, also, and, and so on and so forth. So I, I don't think that the IMF would, uh, would say, all right, we need more austerity. What we need is very clear and it is more public spending right now. Yeah, I totally agree that this is a moment to hope, hope for the best in terms of any structural change that might come. Um, we're coming towards the end, so I think I don't think we have any more time for questions, but thank you so much, everyone who did uh, submit a question. What I'd like to do is, uh, Tobias, if you'd like, just take literally one minute and just sort of summarize some key points or any concluding remarks that you'd like to get in before we close the session. Well, I think I didn't really talk about uh, that much about any of of the of the household and the effects of the households that are. I mean, I did to some extent, but um, what we see now is um, is that a lot of a lot of people and, and specific, again the poor in Latin America are facing the brunt of this of this outbreak, having to go out, having to work. And not being able to to protect themselves and self isolate, and even in cases where you might be able to do so uh, in overcrowded spaces. And I think this, the, while I, I've talked mostly about the macroeconomic in, impacts and the commodity prices, asset prices, currency, etc., I think what what we really need to uh, realize is the, the the severeness of this crisis on the day to day. Uh, people in 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 and, and the working class and, and the informal workers in Latin America, and um, so um, I call maybe to for you to extend the solidarity in any way that you can, be it through um, you know reaching out to organizations that help uh, help people on the ground, or or just uh, you know if you don't have the means, post about it, make 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 people aware that you know. There are situations uh, that are far worse than in, in the UK and in Europe, um, um, and that particularly it is it is the, the very poor that have been suffering for so much uh, for so long under under the neoliberal reforms that are yet again suffering the most. And so either you post about it and make 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 some noise, or if you can, uh, also donate to uh, to uh, some some organizations. And there's plenty out there that you can. You can do that too. So maybe that could be a, a, a more of a human uh, closure to this. And yeah. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining and for these very interesting questions. Thanks, Alice, for moderating. And uh, yeah, we'll see you. We we'll see you hopefully next week. Um, do you want to say yeah. what is up next week and then we close? Yeah. Thank Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much uh, for speaking to us. I think we had a really uh, interesting and constructive discussion. Um, the, next, uh, the next in the webinar series will be Wednesday the 29th. Uh, we'll have uh, Costas Lapavitas, uh, who will be speaking about the limits of neoliberalism, how states respond to crisis. Um, like I said at the beginning, please follow us on our social media. Um, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter uh, at the Open Economics Forum. Uh, we will be posting the recording of this session uh, in case you want to watch it again or share with anyone else. Please do share uh, the webinar as it goes along and hope to uh, see you next time. Thanks a lot, guys, and everybody take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.